Hello and welcome to Forgotten Fronts, I am Jeremy, and in today's episode we'll be playing the scenario, Sabres vs. Bayonets, in which Ney's cavalry charges the 3rd Division under Karl von Alten. But first, the history. If you don't want to hear the history, a time will come up on your screen. Wait for it. Now! By 3.30, Napoleon faced a similar situation as at the Battle of Eilau in 1807, where he broke the Russian attack in his center and pushed back their right, breaking six squares and capturing 16 standards. Napoleon, knowing the approach of the Prussians, prepared a similar strategy to break the Allied center. The Emperor personally ordered the 200 guns of the Grand Battery to intensify their bombardment, realigning their batteries and moving them more to the west of the crossroads. Around this time, the ground was beginning to dry, and so the Great Bombardment was made worse. Never had the most veteran soldiers faced such a cannonade, Karl von Alden, the commander of the 3rd Division, later wrote. As the intense half-hour bombardment occurred, Ney gathered all the cavalry west of the crossroads. This included Milhouse's Cuirassier Corps and Le Beverier de Zenots, light cavalry of the guard. They formed on echelon on squadron between them a gap of 100 yards to avoid stricken horses and riders as they charged. The cuirassiers to the front, their gleaming breastplates and helmets so impressing the British who faced them for the first time that they believed them to be Napoleon's bodyguard, the Chasseur au Cheval de la Garde, the most elite division of the Imperial Guard just behind them. In the rear, Lancers, many of them Polish veterans who returned to France with Napoleon from Elba, and the Dutch Red Lancers, who had distinguished themselves in the campaigns of 1812-14, to 14, who charged at Le Désir, capturing 24 guns and capturing 400 dragoons. Recently, they distinguished themselves at Ligny by covering the withdrawal of the Crassier. Wellington and his staff were confused by this massive cavalry who were facing an untested part of their line and were concerned of supporting infantry and horse artillery, attacking the immobilized squares. In the meantime, Wellington withdrew his infantry battalions to the reverse side of the ridge to get out of the cannon fire and to form square. On the other side of the valley, Marshal Ney either saw this or a crowd of wounded deserters or wagoneers moving to the rear for ammunition and figured that the Allies were withdrawing. He decided now was the time to charge, only being delayed by General Delort, saying that he, there were no orders from Napoleon, as per his orders of June the 16th, which stated, quote, General officers commanding corps will take orders directly from me when I'm present in person. And so Ney sent a runner to General Soult, confirming that the cavalry was under his command, and knowing the urgency as the Prussians were so near, said to him, Forward! The salvation of France is at stake! Which convinced him to move. It should be noted that in some myth that Napoleon left the battlefield due to stomach pain, as the memoirs of his close subordinates who were at Le Caillou all day do not point out that Napoleon Bonaparte returned to them. These would include Baron Dauphin, Fleur de Chambon, and Marchand. I probably butchered them, so I'll put them on screen. This myth began with authors like George Brown. Though Napoleon was not in good shape during the time of the battle either, as Napoleon lacks leave due to planning the coming battle by sending messages to his subordinates and receiving messages from his generals. Napoleon also suffered from hemorrhoids and stomach aches. Despite this, he stayed in the saddle for 37 hours between 18th and 19th of June. This was much less than his prior campaigns. This impeded his mobility on the battlefield, impeding morale. This was probably also due to the doctors leaving some of his medications behind such as running out of leeches and giving him an overdose of landium a couple days before the battle, which Napoleon probably suffered through. In the meantime, the Allied troops on the ridge deployed skirmish lines and cannon batteries on the crest and ordered to fire as much as they could at the advancing cavalry, then to withdraw to the safety of the squares. The battlefield was eerily silent as the French prepared their next attack. The silence was broken by the sound of cavalry bugles from the other side of the valley as French cavalry massed for a new attack. Sir Karl von Alten, in command of the 3rd Division of the 1st Corps, sent couriers to the various brigades who struggled through the drying mud. The first to arrive was that of the, to the 5th Brigade, the riders soaked in mud. Sir Colin Halklet, their commander, was quick to respond, sending orders to the regiments under his command to move to support the cannon on the crest of the ridge. His regiments moved to support the guard regiments, who were woefully overwhelmed by the cavalry facing them. The first to respond was the 33rd Foot, the Duke of Wellington's old regiment, who, to the British Grenadiers, charged through the mud toward the awaiting batteries. Around the same time, a similarly miserable-looking rider arrived at von Alten's side. He thrusted a muddy page at him. It was a dispatch from the Prince of Orange, suspecting a similar cavalry attack. The other regiments soon followed suit, beginning to march to the guns as they pounded the amassing cavalry. A similar message went to Ross's chestnut troop who guarded the approach to La Haison. 
The gunners were not thrilled about moving their guns through the mud, grunting and swearing as they did, and the commander was concerned about abandoning the approach to the farmhouse. Another tired runner was sent to kill Men Singh's 1st Hanoverian Brigade, and he was ordered to defend the two mass batteries, sending them to either of its flanks and in between them. This left the defense of the approach to La Haison to von Andermette's 2nd ha- King's German Legion Brigade, who ordered his men to form line on the crest of the ridge. After pursuing the retreating French out of the garden, Major Baring and one of his battalions saw the mass cavalry and withdrew to the farmhouse once again. One of the riflemen attempted to wrench a ring from the finger of a fallen French soldier, until one of his comrades said to him, Never mind that, the cavalry is coming. Then the Grand Battery opened up with a fury unseen until that moment, and the Duke announced to his entourage huddled around the oak tree behind the farmhouse, Hard pounding, gentlemen! As cannonballs screeched overhead, the artillery was still struggling in the mud towards the other battery. Hacklet urged his men forward at the double. Move yourself, you wretches! You, get to those guns or we'll all be slaughtered! The officers of these regiments echoed these sentiments, pointing their swords forward, shining in the sun as their regiments slogged through the mud. In the meantime, the Hanoverian and King's German Legion brigades were also rushing towards the mass batteries, as mud stained their uniforms as they advanced. At the same time, more regiments moved up, supporting the mass batteries, positioning themselves on the flank and center of the batteries. At this point, our gunners returned fire with a fury, the gunners sponging the barrels to cool them down after such intense usage, firing at the advancing cavalry as their ammunition carousons moved to the reverse side of the slope, and leaving the guns to fire their scarce ammunition before the cavalry arrived. The battalions of foot that rushed to support them were often moved to block the guns in much the ire of the gunners. The Hanoverians were given orders to rush into position by the mass batteries. Many of the gunners moved their guns out of the way of the battalion, with much grumbling. Many of the batteries further to the right having a similar problem while the battalions waited in column. The last of the battalions to arrive was the Highlanders of the 73rd Persia Regiment, who guarded a battery on the left flank of the Hugamon Garden. After the two batteries of guns reformed into the mass battery, mud had gotten into their limbers and the gunners struggled to unlimber them. Then the crack of musketry exploded from an unknown location, and von Alten looked down his line and sent a runner to Hackland to deploy his troops into squares to protect the guns. This in turn further blocked the annoyed gunners, but they soon saw the reason with the nearby cavalry. Many of the gunners prepared their last shot with either double canister or canister with solid shot. Many of the gunners ran to the squares while a brave volunteer stayed behind to fire the final shot. Halkett himself rode behind one of the battalions of the guard who were waiting the order to form square. Von Alten looked pale and thoughtful as he looked on the kaleidoscope of color of the advancing French Dragoon, Carassier, Carabinier, and Garde Chasseur au Cheval. As the cavalry got closer, the air was filled with the sounds of the thumps of hooves of cavalry. As the cavalry got closer, this was joined by the chink of curb chains and armor, and the slap of scabbards on leather, and the cavalry pennants whipping in the wind. The Hanoverians on the left repositioned the massed guns, and the King's German Legion, in the meantime, formed the brigades into square, in a zigzag formation, so the squares could support each other with their fire. Then Kielmenzig sent the Grube Headlight Battalion to fill in the gap between the two German battalions and Hackless Brigade. The battalions struggled through the mud, churned up by the other battalions of their brigade, their colors flopping in the breeze. It was at this point that Kielmenzig moved the whole of the 1st Hanoverian Brigade into a similar formation of the King's German Legion. But at the same time, there came a great rumbling from the other side of the valley as the French cavalry began to charge. The thunder of their hooves became deafening as the troops prepared for contact. We perceived from a distance what appeared to be an overwhelming, long-moving line, which had advancing glitter like a stormy wave on the sea when it caught the sunlight. On came the mounted horse until they got near enough, while the earth seemed to vibrate beneath their thundering tramp. One might suppose nothing could have resisted the shock of this terrible moving mass. They were the famous Francier, who had distinguished themselves so much on the battlefields of Europe. 
As a Hanoverian brigade rushed into squares, making a breakwater to the oncoming flood of cavalry, to our right, the first squadrons of cavalry crested the ridge, and the men shouted, Vive l'Empereur! The officers in our squares replied, Prepare to receive cavalry! The men held their breath as they heard the thunder of the advancing cavalry and the screaming of the bugles and the haze of gunpowder. The men in the first rank knelt, presenting the cavalry with a wall of fire and steel. The volunteers from the guns then rushed towards the safety of the squares. Many of them did not make it and were easily cut down by lances and swords piercing through the thick clouds of smoke. As the courier series crossed through the ridge, the British officers were so impressed by the dazzling helmets and breastplates of what they believed to be Bonaparte's bodyguards, so they ordered their troops to shoot at the horses, forcing them back to the ridge line. This forced the small force of cuirassiers by the farmhouse to hug the ridge line, weathering the hail of musketry from the squares and farmhouse, halting their attack by the farm. Then came another assault on the left flank by Le Hesong towards the squares of the King's German Legion and Hanoverian Brigades, but before they can arrive, the guns of the Chestnut Troop and the 1st King's German Legion foot battery were withdrawn behind the squares. When I fired a volley from my company, which had the effect of adding to the fire of that of the King's German Legion, bringing many of the horses to the ground, that it became quite impossible for the enemy to deter their charge. I certainly believe that half the enemy were at that instant on the ground. Some few men and horses were killed, but by far the greater part were thrown down, dying and wounded. As the horsemen approached the square, some slashed at the exposed men at the corner of the square with sabers or lances. Others took a saber approach by firing into the square with pistols or carbines. The squadron dragoons charged at the square, many of the mounts shot out from under them. Their horses squealed in gut-wrenching pain as they were hit, and their riders shocked as they fell to the ground and were easily captured by the men of the Cambridge Chairs, or simply bayoneted. The fire from the squares continued, their fire adding to the smoke, decreasing the visibility to a few yards. The corpses of the horses and riders began to pile up on the muddy slope, which halted the squadrons approaching the iron hedges of the squares. The squadrons of cuirassiers passed the Cambridge Chairs on the other side of the square, opened fire upon them. The officer, noticing this, ordered his men to shoot at the horses, pile up the horses, and the order was echoed up and down the line, and the sea and mud around the squares were soon turned burgundy. The cuirassiers galloped up, sword in hand, cutting right and left at the gunners, who took shelter beneath the guns. Ah! In this maneuver, the gallant horsemen exposed themselves to the fire of the old Agamemnons, whose heads were on level with the slope of the hill, which proved so destructive to them ah! at that very moment when they thought themselves to be in full possession of their prey. But being without means of spiking or carrying off the guns, they were compelled to retire. The squadron, however, passed the square to charge two nearby Dutch guns, chasing away their crew, hacking down the gunners left and right as they fled. The other gun retaliated by firing a canister at the, uh, the squadron, opening a bloody gap in their formation. But the French cavalry, much like the Scots Greys, had brought nothing to spite the guns with, so they were forced to retire without nothing to show for the immense casualties they had taken on the approach. At this point, the cavalry charge appeared to have slowed to a lull as the cavalry retired to the bottom of the ridge. However, the French marshal, the bravest of the brave, Marshal Ney, despite having his horse shot out from under multiple times and his uniform torn and muddy, he prepared another charge. The cavalry squadrons began to spread out farther to the center. Von Kielmensi, noticing a gap in his line, sent a courier to the light battalion of the Lundbergers to fill it with another square. As the runner arrived, the Lundbergers grabbed some extra ammunition from the nearby ordnance wagons before they formed a column and moved at the double to the flank of an exposed cannon battery, all the while looking anxiously at the squadrons of cavalry rushing up the ridge towards the squares of Hackless and the Footyard brigades. Von Alton, in the meantime, rode to the crest of the ridge. Von Alton, satisfied that the cavalry was withdrawing, retired behind his own square, saluting a nearby troop of cuirassiers who halted nearby. One of the cavalry men responded by raising his heavy saber, and the others scowled at him. As Von Alton passed his line, he saw two battalions had merged in the haste to receive the first charge, so he shouted an order to the 5th Battalion of the King's German Legion. First ordering the battalion to the crossroads of the Brussels Highway, but then noting the route would take them in front of the squares, putting them in danger from the risk of another cavalry charge, he quickly countermanded this order and ordered them to the rear of the line, not helping to increase the confusion as the two battalions untangled themselves from each other. After some confusion as the two squares entangled themselves from each other, the battalion made its way to the rear through the churned up mud. By this point the fighting was slowing down to a lull. To the center of our line it was all mostly quiet as farther down the line a few squadrons of French cavalry withdrew after half-heartedly probing the line of squares once again. As the squadrons withdrew to the bottom of the ridge, the squares continued to pour fire into the withdrawing cavalry. Despite being the bravest of the brave, Marshal Ney's eyes were wide and red, his uniform torn and filthy after charging the ridge, 
and having many horse shot out from under him. But it was not this which shocked him, but the resistance of the allied line and the loss of the Emperor's cavalry. As the cavalry withdrew down the ridge, the gunners emerged from the squares once again, rushing back to their pieces with rammers and port fires in hand to once again bombard the cavalry. As they got to their guns, they loaded and fired frantically at the mass of horsemen at the bottom of the ridge. At the same time, the gunners of the Grand Battery did not return fire with their cavalry so close to the allied squares. This gave the almost free reign to our guns along the ridge to bombard their cavalry. Come on, you bastards! I want to see those guns nearly melt as you blow away the monsoon! As the artillery bombardment of the French cavalry continued, officers looked to see where the line needed reinforcing, all the while wondering if the French would charge once again. In doing this, von Alten sent a courier to the frustrated officer of the 5th Battalion of the King's German Legion to move to support the guns of the exposed battery. At the same time, farther down the line, the Cambridgeers had been exposed to the cannon of the Grand Battery and many cavalry charges, and as consequence had taken heavy casualties, as one of their ranks grimly wrote of the interior of their square, our square was a perfect hospital, being full of dead, dying, and mutilated bodies. At this time, another squadron of cuirassiers advanced, missing their officer who was caught beneath his dying mount, who was living in the mud a few yards away from the ridge. The squadron now led by the NCO of his troop, who commanded from the left side of their ranks. As they approached the square to open fire upon them, and a ball found its mark and hit the NCO, and the troops slowed to a halt and then withdrew. Seeing their chance, the commander of the Cambridgeshires ordered his battalion back between those of the old Agamemnons and one of the footguard squares, moving his men at the double before the cavalry could take advantage of their exposed battalion. Every time the battalion commander looked around the ridge, he saw multiple squadrons of French cavalry approaching the ridge. As the Cambridgeshires approached in their new position of the Grand Battery fired a great volley, and two cannonballs tore through the ranks of the Cambridgeshires, leaving bloody channels in their ranks. Despite this, they were able to form a new square between the two other battalions. Farther down the line, the th 73rd Perthshire Highlanders, their bagpipes wailing the song of Black Bear as they advanced. Some of the men of the 33rd Battalion began to snicker at each other, saying, Why do pipers walk while they play? Why is that? To get away from the noise! A nearby sergeant thumped the man on the shoulder with his cane and said distinctly in a Scottish accent to watch the French cavalry as the cuirassiers approached their own square, and their men opened a fusillade upon them. Hackler saw the situation and was about to send an adjunctive to calm the situation down before a more pressing matter occurred as some of the guard chasers approached the line and a grenadier of cheval charged our squares once again, their sabers flashing the sunlight and riding between the dead and wounded. One of the men of the foot guards yelled, My god, the bastards haven't had enough! The Dutch gunners by the squares held their ground frantically before firing double canister into the ranks of the approaching cavalry, blasting holes in their formation. At the same time, three nearby squares fired volley after volley, and heavy balls thudded into men and horses alike, and the grenadiers did not stand for long. This did not dissuade Marshal Ney from ordering the cavalry at the bottom of the ridge forward into a second charge on the ridge, following the example of the grenadiers. Riderless horses advancing with them, obedient to their herd instincts. Von Alton, seeing the second charge, turned to a member of his staff and said, What wonderful horses! A damn pity, really, but what do you expect from a paltry gunner like Bonaparte? And the sergeant and officers inside the squares ordered their men, Hold your fire! Save your powder for the monsieur! As the thunder of hooves grew nearer, some panicked and didn't heed this order and fired on the advancing cavalry. themselves only made it halfway up the ridge, defiantly firing carbines and pistols on the squares, before the combined volleys of the three squares and the canisters of the Dutch cannon quickly pushed by the cavalry once again. And the second charge only caused the bashing of corpses of horses and riders to grow a little higher, as the uniforms of the cavalrymen were turned instantly red and the horse collapsed, rolling and breaking of the leg of his rider. One cavalryman whose horse was killed was ran over by the retreating cavalry, re leaving his remains unrecognizable in the burgundy mud. A similar situation occurred up and down the line as the second charge began to falter and fall back. 
further to the center of the line, the King's German Legion was given another order to move farther down the line to fill in the gap. The exasperated commander of the battalion yells to his courier, Would you kindly tell the commander to make up his mind so I can accomplish my orders before he runs out of paper? In the meantime, the 8th Battalion of the King's German Legion was sent a courier to move as no charges were made along their position on the Brussels Road. After the withdrawal of the Cambridgeers, the old Agamemnons were taking the brunt of the 2nd Cavalry charge. At the same time, the Yorkshire West Riding, despite being surrounded by a swirling horde of cavalry, held off the cavalry valiantly. Only the screeching cannonballs plowing through their ranks threatened them. In the meantime, the riflemen at Le Haison began to open fire on the cavalrymen circling the farmhouse, threatening to dismount and storm the farmhouse, overpowering the small garrison who were almost out of ammunition, the cavalry charging and hacking at the gates with their heavy swords. Kamaraden, a month's wages to whoever can hit that shiny officer. He should be more careful, he could blind his own men. Human, stop wasting ammunition. Put the officer, put some cement on a charge. Despite the threats of their NCOs, the side of the farmhouse exploded with accurate fire. As the two squadrons of cavalry approached the farmhouse, they were picked apart, the rifle shots easily finding their mark. One of the cavalrymen defiantly firing their carbine back at the green rascal and received the company's worth of fire in response, piercing his breastplate and instantly killing him. But despite the encouragements of the nearby officers, the attack was soon halted. Same could be said for the rest of the French line as the second charge had halted, the Allied squares have held. One of the riderless horses ran to the Allied battery, sickening the gunners and Captain Andreas Cleves, as the lower half of his head was shot away by a cannonball. The wounded horse stayed with the other horses of the battery until Cleves ordered a farrier to put the animal out of his misery. On the other flank, another squadron of cuirassiers was sent away by the blasting muskets and blaring bagpipes of the 73rd Perthshire Regiment. Moving to the rear, the 8th Battalion of the King's German Legion was nearing its position now that the commander was not being constantly harassed by couriers from von Alten. Seeing that his guns were being severely underused, von Alten, who was running dangerously low on paper at this point, sent a runner to the 1st King's German Legion foot battery, who was ordered to support the squares of the Hanoverians, seeing that the cavalry had changed its focus to the center of our line. As the battery struggled through the mud, Captain Andreas Cleves looked over his shoulder and saw more squadrons advancing on the two foot battalions and threatening Sandam's Royal Foot Artillery. Around this time, the 1st King German Legion Horse Battery was ordered to move their guns to support the two battalions on the right flank by moving behind Hougamaw Orchard. Ross's Chestnut Troop was moved in between the squares of the 1st Hanoverian Brigade and began to rain shot and shell on the mass cavalry at the bottom of the ridge to suppress them. While on the left flank, the cavalry recoiled on the right flank, and two squadrons approached the squares of the Yorkshire West Riding Regiment and the Perthshire Highlanders. Seeing this, Henry Kuhlman ordered his horse battery into a gallop to support the squares. The batteries flung mud as they flew by, their garrisons flying erratically in the air. Then another runner arrived at the 1st King's German Legion foot battery, ordering them to advance to support the squares of the Cambridgeshire's and Old Agamemnons. The gunners begrudgingly began to shift their heavy guns in the mud, after being ordered from the safety of the squares. In the meantime, another squadron of cuirassiers advanced up the ridge. However, the fire of the Yorkshire West Riding and the nearby Dutch cannon brought down the large amount of horses and created an undescribable confusion as the horses of the front rank came to a standstill. Despite the urging of their riders, the squadron was forced to withdraw. However, this did not dissuade two more squadrons from advancing on the Perthshire Highlanders, all the while the horse artillery thundered, halting short of their destination to blast the cuirassiers as they came around the square. Two squadrons of cuirassiers advanced on the Highlanders, bagpipes cackled from inside the square as the cuirassiers advanced, their armor covered in blood and black with mud. As they approached, the Major ordered his men to fire. The effect was like a scythe as men fell to the ground in the 50s and 60s, 
Nearby, the guns of the 1st King's German Legion Horse Battery unlimbered, aiming their pieces down the ridge towards the 2nd Squadron, the gunners quickly loading canister. Some of the gunners struggled to find a clear line towards the cavalry. At that very moment, the Dutch cannon fired a canister at the large squadron, and it was blown to pieces. The canister troughed limbs of both man and horse alike. Their armor only added metal splinters to the deadly shot. After taking such devastating casualties, the squadron soon withdrew. To the center of our line, similar things could be said of the other batteries as they arrived in their positions and unlimbered, providing an opposing sight for the cavalry squadrons who regrouped to make another charge on the ridge. To our left, Ross's chest and the battery by La Haye Song continued to pound the cavalry at the bottom of the ridge, men working their pieces efficiently. To the center of the 1st King's German Legion foot battery unlimbered, and two more squadrons of Carassia rushed, rushed the two guns between the Yorkshire West Riding and Cambridgeshire Squares. Seeing the heavy cavalry thundering towards the last gun of his battery, a battery commander galloped toward them, ordering his men to stand and fire on the advancing squadrons. Eventually the squadron crested the ridge, and the commander and gunners attempted to run to safety of the squares, but the infantry would not let them in, not, and not risk opening up their squares to the cavalry. So the gunners were forced to run to the squares further to the rear, as a result many were cut down by the cuirassiers' heavy swords. Few gunners were able to escape as the squadrons were eventually driven back by the spitting musketry of the squares. Von Alton looked to his left flank with his spyglass over the ridge by the Haysaw. Seeing that the land around the farmhouse was clear of enemy cavalry, a plan began to form. On the right flank, a large squadron of cuirassiers was pushed back as the guns of the 1st King's German Legion horse artillery blasted canister into their rank, followed by two more canister blasts. In the center, another squadron of cuirassiers makes a charge between the Yorkshire West Riding and the Cambridge Shares, looking for more vulnerable cannons, but they were quickly repelled by musket fire. But despite the artillery fire that cut other squadrons to pieces, three more squadrons advanced in the Hinder Square. In the meantime, the 5th Battalion of the King's German Legion advanced to protect the exposed cannon from more charges from the heavy cavalry. His attention was then shifted to the Allied squares as the Yorkshire West Riding took particularly high casualties, as round shot piled to their ranks and limbs and arms and heads flew in all directions. One man in the ranks turned to another, grabbing onto him, his arm blown off just below the elbow, and he bled profusely onto his trousers before passing out, and a great shout comes from the King's German Legion as they advance their squares to the La Haison. With a great cheer, the 1st King's German Legion Light Battalion was the first to make an advance towards the Haison. Earlier, men were given a second supply of ammunition to give to the garrison of Le Haisson when they arrived nearby. The battalion then advanced to the garden. Not long afterward, the battalion of Verden moved up to protect the flank of the King's German Legion. Then the field battalion of Osbrook moved behind the two squares to recreate the triangle of the original formation to catch the cavalry in their jaws. Seeing the nearby cavalry squadrons, the Light Battalion of the King's German Legion and the Verden Battalion were ordered to move by the double to support the farmhouse.
Following their example, to the right of the battery, the white battalion of Grubenhang and advanced to the nearby tree, despite three nearby squadrons of French cavalry. Seeing the nearby cavalry, they do so at the double. A nearby squadron appears to react by galloping in that general direction, however they instead move to the rear, much to the relief of many in the battalion. On the right flank, probing attacks continue as another squadron of cuirassiers approach the squares in the Cambridgeshire Foot Guard and Yorkshire West Riding, as well as the newly arrived 5th Battalion of the King's German Legion. They advance into the jaws of death with one of the saviors as the cavalry rode through the hail of lead. Volley after volley poured into the advancing cavalry. The noise was like that of a violent hailstorm against a pane of glass, leaving heaps of stirring and crying, whimpering horrors before the squadron withdrew. The 33rd fired a few more shots into the withdrawing cavalry, then ramrods clattering in the barrels as the men quickly reloaded. Nearby cannon thundered and returned the fire of the Grand Battery as their round shot plowed through the ranks of the Allied squares. As the Lone Cavalry Squadron withdrew, the 5th Battalion of the King's German Legion advanced beyond the square of the, one of the Foot Guard regiments. The battalion struggled in the sea of mud and fallen cavalry to find an open ground to form a new square. On the left flank, more battalions advanced as a light battalion of the Grubenhagen moved towards a, a defiant tree which had stood against the barrage of the Grand Battery and had suffered no damage. Colonel Autopard galloped past the, the squares by La Haisan, quickly inspecting his men and ordering them forward to relieve the garrison of La Haisan before returning to the rear. The squares advanced to the side of the farmhouse as they moved at the double, nervously looking at the nearby squadrons of French cuirassiers. Then the Hanoverian battalions continued their advance, the field Jaeger advancing past the chestnut troop, much to the annoyance of Ross, blocking most of his guns. Then came the light battalion of the Wimburgers, advancing to support the squares of the old Agamemnons and Cambridgeshire. By now, the French cavalry had broken out of his hesitation, and three squadrons advanced to the right. One of their officers followed just behind him, his hat gone and screaming at his men to keep charging, his eyes as wild as some of the horses. The dragoons advanced on the Highlanders, facing a fire of unbelievable violence. The Highlanders fired a rag of volley. A dragoon cried out his woman's name, and a horse limped to the rear, dragging his rear leg and dripping with blood. At the same time, the Grenadier of Cheval charged the squares of the Yorkshire West Riding and the 5th Battalion of the King's German Legion, and they both answered with volleys. One of the Grenadiers slumped over the neck of his horse but clung onto the horse, which followed its herd obediently. Another man fell from his mount and was dragged through the mud by his spurs to the rear of the French line. More squadrons advanced on the squares of the Hanoverians in another desperate charge. One soldier turned to another and asked, Why do the fools persist? The other responded without hesitation, Pride! They want to justify the amount of men lost. Around the same time, more Hanoverian squares advanced, beginning with the Field Jaeger, rushing forward to the nearby cavalry, completely blocking the guns of the Chestnut Troop. Finally, the squares of the King's German Legion arrived at La Haisant, sending companies one by one to distribute ammunition to the grateful garrison. On the right flank, the King's German Legion also advanced their square, despite the warnings of a nearby Dutch officer, struggling to find a place to form squ another square in the pile of butchered horses and mutilated corpses. At the bottom of the ridge, the French cavalry appeared to begin to withdraw back behind their artillery, refusing to make another suicidal charge in the ridge. Seeing this, the Persian Highlanders advanced to the Hudemont Orchard, advancing to the sound of all the blue bonds go o'er, but this was quickly halted as another squadron was seen in the orchard. The Grenadier au Cheval finally broke, and their squadron withdrew over the piles of bodies of the dead and dying. Seeing the faltering French cavalry, Otomapa rides alone out to go to the French to attack his squares once again. Seeing that he was having no response, the officer rode behind his line once again. He soon was met by Colonel Barry, who thanked him for relieving the garrison. The withdrawing cavalry encouraged more of the Hanoverian squares forward, namely that of the Field Battalion Onsbrook, who advanced past the squares at La Haison. The field battalion of Bremen was the next to advance, despite the nearby cavalry. They were covered by two other squares from the 1st Hanoverian Brigade. 
The French cavalry regrouped for one final desperate charge. To prepare for this, the cannons of the Grand Battery opened another great barrage, in which the Yorkshire West Body took particularly vicious casualties. As one wrote, we had three companies almost shot to pieces. One shot killed or wounded 25 of the 4th Company, and another killed poor Fisher, my captain, and 18 of our company. After the artillery bombardment, the French cavalry were able to regroup and break out of their spell of hesitation, and three squadrons began to advance on the Highlanders once again. In response, the Cambridge troops advanced with double to support the square of the King's German Legion, but in reality, the officer didn't want to be outdone by the Germans. However, their advance was shortened as a small squadron of French cuirassiers grew too near, and the men formed square once again, firing from a makeshift barricade of dead horses. In the meantime, the field battalion of Remen doubles to its position as the French cavalry approaches the center of the line, following the orders of the 1st Hanoverian Brigade of advancing. Another battalion to advance was the Field Battalion of Osbrook, which advanced to support the King's German Legion and Field Jaeger squares by the Haysan. Then the Light Battalion of the Human Hagen and Lundberger advanced to the center despite the nearby cavalry. Seeing the advance of the whole of von Alten's division and the high casualties of the French Cavalry Corps was too much and Ney called off the attack. Message for you, Bonantre. No, the Prussians, so soon. This is no longer a battle. 
This is now a race. We must break through their lines now. One more attack by the cavalry. No! If the Prussians are on their way, must, we must use them to drive them back before they deploy. Well, whatever you do, I've set up a trap for the Prussians. That should delay them, but I don't know for how long. I implore you to attack, or all will be lost. Marshal Ney, urgent orders from the Emperor. The English are about to break. You must use your cavalry to attack by La Haison. Sir? The salvation of France is at hand. You must go now. The Prussians are almost upon us. Now to meet the doctor. Is that thunder? I hope we don't come under another downpour. Nine is the sound of the cannon. We near the battle. We must march to the sound of the guns. What the hell was that? Ambush! By the ridge! My leg! Damn partisans! We are trying to save them from the French threat! What is Nate doing? What is Nate doing? Doesn't he know he cannot attack with cavalry without infantry support? We need those cavalry to hold back the Prussians!